Hello everyone, this is Butch Hurd with Carlson Software. Uh, we have a webinar for you today. It's working with points in Carlson Software. It's going to be presented by Jennifer Devona of That CAD Girl. Uh, Jennifer, if you can hear me, uh, introduce yourself and we can uh, get going. We'll allow questions. You can type them in. And if we can't get to all of them or don't know the answers, we will uh, return them after the webinar. And Jennifer can also get back in contact with you after the webinar. Okay, thanks, Butch. Um, as Butch said, today's topic is working with points and Carlson software. And a few things that we will, just so you know what's upcoming, a few of the things we're going to cover today are there's a lot of confusion that I find um, in the difference between setting up your point default and drawing and locating points. We will also talk about um, how non-surface points can help you when building surfaces. And we'll talk about point groups, translating, rotating, and comparing points. So just a little bit of, I guess, the admin stuff here. We'll talk about um, the upcoming Carlson webinars. Um, you can find these. Everybody found this one, so a lot of people I know get an email advertising the webinars that are upcoming. Uh, these are the ones that I'll be doing. We have working with points today and we've got drawing scales and annotation coming up on August 8th. On August 20th, for those of you that may have attended the paper space and model space webinar, we um, had some technical difficulties there, did not get that one recorded. And of course that was the one we got, I think probably at least a dozen questions and people asking for that recording. So we didn't get it recorded. What we're going to do is just repeat that on Friday, August the 20th, and we'll get that one recorded. And then on August 26th, we're going to have tips and tricks for preparing drawings for surface model building in Carlson. Now, I know that Paul Carlson has a couple somewhere in between there, and I don't know too many of the details, but keep a look out there. Um, in between the ones that I'm showing here. In addition, I was going to also mention uh, upcoming training classes. Now these are two-day hands-on training here in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. Uh, the one coming up next week is full. Uh, we do limit these to 10 people. So if you're interested at all, definitely contact me to set those up. My Field to Finish is a class on August 16th to 17th. And that class is two days hands-on, but we will also spend time ahead of that working together in online sessions. What I want you to do for that class is to bring your own descriptions, bring your layers, bring your symbols, and those kinds of things. We will teach how to work with field to finish, but also when you walk out, you will be working with your own field code file. So those two days you will create um, your own field to finish file. Surface modeling with Carlson is repeated in August. And then my company standards, again, is a two-day class in September with out, you know, some time spent ahead of time on a uh, online session. In my company standards, again, you'll bring your layers. This time we'll work with text styles, we'll work with line types, uh, creating custom line types, creating block libraries, Again, when you walk out after those two days of hands-on, you will have a pretty complete set of company standards uh, for you. So with that, I'm just going to switch over now. Today's presentation, I will be working with Carlson Survey 2010 on top of IntelliCAD. And everything I'm doing will be limited to the survey module. So whether you are working in the embedded or the IntelliCAD version, uh, there shouldn't be any difference. So one thing I'll just mention under settings that I have made sure to turn on is under general settings I have turned on my object linking for grouping point entities and maintaining a CRD history file. And then I just want to note that the drawing I'm starting with is a totally empty drawing. So there's not a single layer that has been created at this point. So we will look at, under the points menu, we will look at point defaults. 
So I'm not going to, I know a lot of people working with Carlson already have a fairly good handle on working with points. So this is really to maybe what I would call fill in the gaps on things that are a little bit confusing and why is it putting it on the layers that it is and so on. So a couple things to point out here in point defaults is in the upper left corner of this box, the point prompt label setting. So we have descriptions, we have elevations both checked on. That means that by default, when we set a point, it will prompt us for descriptions and it will label them on the screen. By default, it will prompt us for elevations and then show the elevation on the screen. We are also having it here locate that point on the real Z axis. What that means is that, of course, when we set that point, when we assign an elevation, the CRD file that we're associated with will record that and keep that in that external CRD file. What this um, checkbox means is that the actual point node um, and or symbol, whether that will be set at the real world elevation. So we're going to look at that and spend a little bit of time with that. The attribute layout ID, you have some options here between, I think there's a zero, down to nine. And you can see we're set to attribute layout ID. Zero looks like this looks like that. Uh, so you have a bunch of different options on what by default now. Remember we're working in the point defaults dialog. By default, what should and how should those attributes be laid out around that point? The symbol name, I'm using no symbol basically. So it will be just a dot, just a point. It will actually be hard to see. But by using this, it will not interfere with other symbols that I may have. So for instance, you can see all of these different points that I could have it set up to. So a lot of people use an X. Um, again, for, for purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to leave that blank. Now, uh, actually, let me, let's skip on down here for a second. We've got automatic point numbering, the starting point numbers. I'm gonna be one. Now the layer for points, this is again a default. Um, unless it gets information from elsewhere, it will put all the points that we set on layer PNTS. Now there is an option here, again we'll talk about this a little bit more later, how you can separate out the point, the symbol, or both, and all those attributes. Okay, so now in the upper right, under the Use field to finish, notice that as we start, I have every one of these unchecked. So what I'm saying is that by default, I want it to use the settings here and not rely on a field to finish file. Now if I have these things checked, what I will also need to do is look here at the bottom where it says table none. So I do not currently have a field to finish code table set. So for it to use field to finish, it's going to want to have that table set here. Okay, so this is point default. Let's pick OK. I haven't, um, I don't think I've actually made any changes, but I'll cancel in case I had. Now, draw, lake, draw locate points. So this is the mechanism if you just want to manually draw points into the drawing, we would go to draw locate. You can see that there's a lot of duplication. So the symbol name, we had an option to set that in point default. This setting here is being read currently from the point defaults. So let's say that I want my default to stay at SPT0, but for this set of points, this next two or three points that I want to draw in, I want them to have a different symbol. So I could change that here. So this doesn't affect the default of the drawing, or I'm sorry, of the uh, installation. Again, we have point prompt labeled settings. So for the points that I'm getting ready to set, I do want it to prompt me for descriptions, and I want it to label descriptions. 
I do want it to prompt for elevations and I want it to label description. You can see I have it also set here to locate those points on the real Z axis, so they'll have real world elevations. And then the decimals are set to zero. Starting point number again is one. And then the layer name, again, these are currently reading from the point defaults box, so nothing different. So now what are we going to draw? That's what all these buttons are at the bottom. If I have a if I'm already associated with a CRD file, which I'm not, you can see at the top, if I am associated with a CRD file and it already has points in it, I can pick the button for draw range and I can just put in a range of points for it to draw. I can use this button. Again, I have to be associated with a CRD file that already has points. I can draw all the points in the CRD file using the settings that are set here. Same with point group. If I had a point group, uh, point groups are saved in the CRD file. If I were associated, I'd be able to use that. Now, if we are not currently associated with a CRD file, we're going to use one of these two buttons. Enter and assign allows me to enter either northing, easting elevation, X, Y, Z, however you prefer to phrase that. So if I know those coordinate values, I could do an enter and a sign. If I just want to pick a point on the screen and set a point with all of these settings, I use the screen pick option, which I'll do here. Prompts me to pick a point to create, so I'll just pick a point here. Now, as soon as we start to assign that point number, it realizes I'm not associated to a CRD file yet. So I'm going to create a new one, and I'll browse and go to the folder I have set up for today. And I'm just going to call this uh, point 01. Pick open. Now it's asking for the elevation of this point, so I'll be very generic, and I'm going to, this is a very generic sample, so nothing, uh, this is to kind of get the point across and explain what's happening behind the scenes. So. We're just going to set an elevation of 100 here. And then the point description, again, being very generic, I'm going to call it line. Okay, so you can see that the point was drawn into the drawing using those uh, settings as established in point defaults and also in the draw locate. So the only point symbol I have is just that there's actually not one. It's just a node for the point have a um, description, elevation, and point number. So I'll pick one more. And the elevation here, let's just do 110 and the same description. OK. Now I'm going to set two more and give a little bit of a different elevation. And the description here, this will be a triangle. So I'm going to give it a description even though I'm only setting two points, of TRI for triangle. So now as I set these, we are writing these points. So they're showing up in the drawing, but they're also writing to the CRD file. So if I go to points and list points, and the range of points to show, I'm just going to pick all. Now this is a static report, so if I make changes, I can put cursor returns and what have you in here, and it's not going to write anything out to the CRD file from here. If I actually need to make changes to a point, I would have to go to points and edit points, which also shows you a list, but you can see that these are the, the descriptions that I typed in, and they match what's on the screen. So very simple how that's working. It's all writing to that CRD file. So let's now look at how layers are managed using the, def oops, using the default options. I don't know why that switched off. Um, so how are the layers being managed? Well, if we look in the layer list, we have created four layers. So PNTS, that's what the dot is. So that's the actual point. That's the intelligence of the thing. P 
PNTNO is the point number, PNTELEV is the elevation, PNTDEFC is the description. Notice that even though I have, um, I have different descriptions, it looks like they're all kind of congregated, regardless of description, on the same layer. So let's look at one of my favorite commands, which is the layer inspector. So if you're not familiar with the layer inspector, this actually gives you a list of all the layers in the drawing. So if I left click on PNTS, they're very, very faint, but you can see the dots. Now notice what happens when I pick the point number. Notice that nothing shows up. These points are blocks, and they're called nested blocks. Every, the entire point is managed by the PNTS layer. So if you want to see any part of that point, the PNTS layer has to be visible. And then I'm holding control. Now I can pick on point number so that in addition to seeing the point node, I can also see the point number. Again, holding elevation. Now I can see the elevation. Now I can see the description. So this may not be the optimal setup for you because let's say that you have um, a lot of back of curve shots that are exactly adjacent to edge of pavement shots. Well, if you set it up and use all these defaults, everything's managed by the same set of layers. So if I would like to kind of clean up my drawing and only see the elevations, maybe, of um, the back of curb shots. I can't do it using these defaults. I have to kind of dig in deeper, get a little more granular in setting up those points. So let's introduce field to finish. Um, very, I'm not going to get too deep into it. There's an awful lot that field to finish can do for you. But I also want to show you just uh, kind of minute, if you use it just minimally, what it can do for you. So I'm going to go to points and point default. And I'm going to make just a couple changes. So I'm going to check all these options on. So what these options say is that if I create a point from using any mechanism, if I create a point, and the description of that point has a code set up in my field to finish table, then it should pay attention to the field to finish in order to set the symbol. In other words, if the code exists in the field to finish file, it will ignore the symbol that I have set here. Same thing for layers. If the code exists in field to finish table, it will ignore the layer that I have set here. Same thing all the way down. If I have an attribute layout ID, if I have a description, if I have on real Z and the code matches a field code in my field to finish file, it will ignore those settings up here. So the other step that I need to do or take here is to set the table. So I need to set the field to finish field code file that it needs to read from. So I'll pick open. This is very simple. I'm going to go into it and show you here in a couple minutes. But again, all I'm doing is changing the point defaults. Pick OK. And now I'll go to Draw and Locate. And I'm simply, again, all of these settings here, if I enter a description that matches the field code, it's going to ignore these. So if I screen pick and pick a point here, give it an elevation of um, 140. And I'm going to mimic what I have. So I'm going to give this a description of line. Now notice that there's really no difference between this one, this one, and this one. Hmm. Let's pick another one. So I'll pick a point here. I'll give it a, an elevation of 150. And this time I'll give it a description of TRI for triangle. So we get a really different result when I now set that point and I have my field to finish options turned on. What all is different? Well, one, obviously the symbol is different. Two, you can see that the layout ID is different. 
So I have my point number elevation description stacked instead of arrayed around that point. And then also remember that the description that I typed in, so the description in my CRD file, I put in TRI. But when it draws it in the drawing, it expands that description and calls it a triangle. So let's go to points and list, um, actually we'll just do edit points. And you can see that yes, that description here in the CRD file is TRI. But again, it shows up on my screen as triangle. So a couple things. When we turn on endpoint defaults and tell it to use the field to finish data, so when we turn these on, it does not affect, as we can see here, points that already exist in the drawing. It's only going to affect new points that are created after we make that change. If we want all of the triangle points to show up the same way as this does, we actually need to draw all these points again. And I will go to draw field to finish. So you can see that the FLD file is set. Actually, not knowing, let's see. All right, I'm not sure why it's not showing that there, but there it is. Let's just load it in again. There it is. So in this field code file, the only point code that I have created is the TRI. So you can see that TRI is the code. So that's what matches the description we type in or that we put in in the field through a data collector. I am telling it here to use a full description. So what I'm just saying um, or letting, letting the computer do is that anytime it sees a TRI description come in from a data collector from the point file, that it needs to put it on my screen and show it as a triangle. So how can this work practically, real world? Um, a BOC shot in the field could be translated here to a full, what I would call a full description of back of curve. Now, if I want my raw description, so the one that comes in through the point file, the CRD file, to be the same as the description, I can tell it to use the raw description. So I'm just going to set that to... I think both works there. Um, I've also told it that any points that come in with a TRI description need to be sorted into a point group called triangle. So we'll see how point groups work here in a couple minutes. I also am telling it, if you look down here, that any points with a description of TRI need to be drawn as both a 3D and a 2D polyline. The 2D polyline layer is shown here, so I've tried to keep this again very simple and just show you the very basics. The points themselves are going to go on to their own layer called triangle points. The dual 3D polyline, so I will have a, uh, another line work that's going to be drawn with 3D triangle. and. Actually, I just realized I wanted to show one other thing before I got in here, but we'll go through it. I'm also having it separate out all of those attribute layers. So if you remember the first few points that we created, um, the TRI description and the LINE description, all of the layers were managed by that master four layer. So PTS or PNTS and then point number and so on. What I'm going to have it do here is, and I, this is a little bit overkill, but I want everybody to see how it can be done. When points are set using this description from the field code file, the attribute for the point number will go on this layer, specific to the triangle. The elevation specific to the triangle will go on this layer. Description here and the symbol here. So the triangle will go on symbol and the little dot will go on triangle underscore PNTS. Okay, um, a couple other things just to briefly mention here. 
by the field code file, I am telling it here to locate that point on the real Z axis. I am telling it to use attribute layout ID 2, so I can see that that's how they show up stacked. I can also set the decimal places based on the description. So for ground shots, you may choose to only use one um, decimal place, and others would be two. So I don't think I've made any changes. I'm just going to cancel, and now when I pick the draw button, it takes me to the draw field to finish. I'm going to have it redraw all the points, and those that have a description of TRI are now going to all be redrawn. It will erase the existing entities, so I'm not going to have duplicates. So I'll just pick OK. You can see that these were drawn based on the default because the line did not show up in my field code file, and you can see that all of these were again um, are now drawn with that triangle symbol and now let's look at the layers. So you can see that in the list of layers we have 2D triangle which is the line work connecting those triangle points. We've got 3D triangle which is also there you just can't see it but that's a 3D polyline um, connecting those same points. PNTF, PNTNO, PNTELEV, and PNTDESC are all going to manage the layers for the line uh, points. And then here are all the layers that are going to manage the points here. So you've got a lot more flexibility than, than we had previously. Okay, so let's again just kind of look at... Um, Actually, I think, I think we're good here. We can look at the layer inspector one more time, but I think you can kind of uh, get the picture. So notice I've got chosen here isolate. So that's why it's only showing me the 2D triangle layer. Here it's showing me the 3D triangle layer. Again, I can pick all four. Oops. And... Uh, it's not showing up. I'm not sure why. It's just the viewer, I think. So there are my triangle symbols. So you can just see, again, we get a lot of flexibility with that. So I'm going to exit and then point out a couple more things with regard to field to finish and drawing these points. So a lot of people, if you um, bring it in from a data collector or an ASCII file, I just want to point out that under the import text or ASCII file that there is an option down here on the bottom. So to draw points, you can tell it here either off, which means that as you import points from a text file into the CRD file, it will not draw them at all. So you will either have to manually go to draw locate or manually go to draw field to finish in order to get the drawing the points in your drawing. Or you can have it set to draw locate, and in that case, when you when you as soon as you import those points into the CRD file, it will use the settings established in draw locate and draw the points according to that. Or if you have it set to field to finish, it will um, use the table that's assigned through point defaults. Okay. All right, so let's look and just explore a little bit the non-surface, um, sorry, the um, draw on real Z option that we had for these points. So everything that we have drawn in the drawing has been drawn on the real Z axis. And I'm going to use 3D viewer window and just select all of these and let's see what that looks like. So notice that I do not have a check mark here next to ignore zero. So it's not ignoring zeros. And I'm just going to tip this up on its side. And you can see here are the three uh, points with the description of line that I drew. Here are the three points with the triangle description. This is the 3D polyline, so it's showing up here elevated. And then the blue line down below is that zero elevation 2D polyline. 
And if I ignore zero elevation by checking here, you can see that one disappear. So we know exactly which one it is. So one of the things that's pretty powerful with Carlson is that you have the ability to set any of your points and even any entities and what we call is say is tag them as a non-surface point. So practically where can that where can you use that? Well, for instance, um, if I'm processing surveyed points and I have an existing concrete monument, so an ECM description, um, an EIP, existing iron pipe, if you think about the elevations of those, um, those types of shots, normally I just say that they're, either gonna, they're probably going to be six inches in the ground, they're going to be six inches out of the ground. Regardless, they're not going to be a good point for me to use when building a topo. So points like that, based on their descriptions, I usually just automatically want them to be a non-surface point. Fire hydrant, top of a fire hydrant, if that's ever a, an issue, you may want to make all of your FH descriptions automatically be a non-surface point. So you can do that through field to finish based on the description. But if you have just a point in your drawing that you just want to select off the screen, you can do it as well. So I'm in the survey menu. Under surface, we have a menu item for non-surface points and entities. So the top little group here is for non-surface entities. So if you want to select a line or a polyline, you can select it here. What I want to do is tag non-surface points. So I'm going to pick that. I can do it based on a selection set. I can base it on a description. I can do a range and so on. So I'm just going to pick OK and let's, do, um, let's just do this point number five here. So it tells me at the command line that one point has been tagged as being non-surface. So how can I see that? How do I know that's happened? Well if I go back to the 3D viewer window and I select all the points including point five you can see that it doesn't show up. So even though a lot of people don't realize this, that when you tag it as non-surface, it's truly going to be ignored um, by everything that may have to do with building a surface. So one big reason we use the 3D viewer is to look at and kind of do a pre-audit and um, get a preview of the entities we're going to use to build a surface. So by doing it this way, I can see automatically that it's not there. And it's not because I'm ignoring zeros either. So I've turned it on so that I'm not ignoring zero elevations, and that point still doesn't show up. So it's truly being ignored. One other place that that will show up is a lot of us will do draw and shrink wrap entities to create a boundary around our surface point. So if I create a shrink wrap and I select everything including point 5 which is my non-surface point, you can see that it ignores it there as well. So it's really a powerful little tool. So again I pointed out that under the survey menu it's under surface, non-surface points and entities and they've decided to hide it. Um, hide it from us in civil. They've actually stuck it here under 3D data and um, non-surface points and entities. So same things available here in civil. So we've seen how to manually do that, but what's the easiest way to do it if um, we want to always do it based on description like I said? Well what you can do is in field to finish there is an an option here for non-surface. So if I create that as non-surface and pick OK, I'll make a change to this field to finish file and I'm going to redraw everything and it erase the old and that one's no good any longer. So now it's all been drawn. Um, the triangle descriptions are now non-surface points. If I select everything you can see that the line work 
has been drawn, but I can ignore that. So only the 3D line work and the line, uh, the points with the description of line are now available to, uh, to be used for that surface. Okay, so one, one thing that I, reason I like to point that out is um, one, field of finish is pretty powerful, um, but also, actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that, I'm going to talk about it with point groups here in just a second, so got ahead of myself a little bit. So let's look at what's happened with point groups based on running that field to finish. So if we look under points and point group manager, you can see that based on that field description, uh, field code file, that for any points that have a description, actually it does it by point number, but we did it based on description as it came in through our field to finish file, anything that had a description of triangle was automatically put into this point group. So how can you manually create a point group? So under point under groups, I'm going to create a point group. I will call this, again, getting highly technical and call it lines. And I can include points in that, in this new point group. If I uncheck all, I can do it based on a description. Now if I want to select, I can do that and pick a point in the drawing and it will grab its description or I can set that from a list. So this is a very small point file, or coordinate file obviously, but if I had a huge long, um, huge long CRD file, I could sort these by description and be easy to pick it out and easy to see. So all I need to do is pick one point with the description and it will populate this value here and I'll save changes Here's a new point group called lines. Okay, so again, how can this be used in real life? Um, one thing I like to do, and I usually do most of this through field to finish, is that points with a CLD for center line of ditch description, uh, points with a TB or a BB for bottom of bank, top of bank, I'll usually make through field to finish a point group called existing ditch and that point group will collect all of my center line of ditch, top of bank shots. You may make one for existing road that collects all your center line of road, all of your curb, who knows, maybe your shoulder, edge of pavement, and those kinds of points. So you can create point groups based on multiple descriptions and add those in if you want. So what else can we do? Let's say that um, we just want to do it by points in the drawing. So we'll call this one, um, so this will be our very important point. If you just want to do it from points in the drawing, you can select this option for point list and then drawing select. And I'll just pick these and save changes. And there is my VIP point group with two lines and one triangle. Okay, so there's one other thing I want to point out in point groups. And let's create one more new one. And um, I'm just going to call this, I don't know, I already have a very important point group. I don't know where to go after that. But let's say we want to get a little bit um, more specific. So what I'd like to see here is all points except that certain elevations are not going to be good. So for this one, I will include all points. And notice here, this is a good little tip, and it's very important to tell you how to navigate this. Inclusion rules. So anything on the include tab is applied before the exclusion rules. And then a point has to meet all of the following rules to be included. And we basically get the same thing on the exclude tab. For it to actually exclude a point, a point has to meet all of these rules. So I want to include all points except points that uh, are between elevation 105 and 125. 
So I'm excluding an elevation range 105 to 125. I think that's what I said. And I'll save changes. Here is my test. So you can see that it's left out points numbers, point numbered 2 to 3 because they fell between 105 and 125. So you can get kind of creative with this. Um, and this is what I was going to say a couple minutes ago. Those of you coming from Land Desktop, it's um, Carlson as delivered out of the box using defaults. Primarily the locate points on real Z axis is kind of different for us because with Land Desktop, the points in the drawing had zero elevation. So you could draw um, a line from point to point and have that line be drawn at zero elevation because the point in the drawing had a zero. But then when we went to build the surface, what do you have to do? You can't just pick points in the drawing because they have zero. You have to create a point group in Land Desktop in order to get it to read those elevations. So the same thing applies here. You have the option through point defaults, through field to finish, through whatever mechanism you want to have it, when it draws points in the drawing, have those points on an elevation of zero so that you can draft and connect the dots and have all of your line work at zero elevation. But when you go to triangulate and contour, you can't pick those points to be part of your surface because, again, they have a zero elevation. So what you would have to do instead is when you triangulate and contour, instead of selecting points in the drawing, there is an option for, and I can actually just go there, under selection, instead of using the points, which means that you select them from the drawing, you would select this option from file or point group. And I will just tell you, you can make that point group any way you want. Uh, you can do it manually if you want to, but it is a little difficult. The best way and the easiest way to collect points into a point group in order to build a topo from it is going to be through field to finish. So there's a lot more that can be said on that. Hopefully I didn't confuse anyone. Um, so that's kind of that. Let me cancel this. Um, and getting a little short on time, so just kind of quickly, I'm going to go into another drawing. And in this drawing, as you can see by the drawing name, it is Translate, Rotate, and Compare. And I will set, I've already got a CRD file. So notice that I have two. So I'm going to work in this one, TRC, for Translate, Rotate, and Compare. But I have another one that's identical to it that I'm going to leave it here as the original. We're going to compare it to that. So compare changes we make in TRC to the original one. Okay, so if I just quickly do a list points all or translate, you can see the points that I have. So to translate points, I'm going to go to the points menu and then adjust coordinates. Now, for pre, um, earlier versions of Carlson Survey, there's not an Adjust Coordinates option here. I think that Translate and Rotate are just in the main list. But we'll translate points. And I'll cancel because I forgot to explain what I wanted to do. So what I want to do is translate points 1, 2, and 3 with the triangle, uh, the legs of the triangle down so that point 1 exactly matches up and sits on point 4. Then we're going to rotate because points 1 and 2 are the same distance apart as 4 and 5. We will then rotate those points um, so that um, basically 1 and 2 lie right over top of 4 and 5. So once again, I'll go to Adjust Coordinates and Translate. So this looks like an intimidating box, but it's really not that bad. What we want to see here, this is the original point. So when I translate, where am I coming from? What point is my original? I'm going to move everything using point one. And if I don't know the point, I can actually pick it, or I can pick it from a list. 
So point 0.1 is going to translate down to point 0.4. Okay. I do want to translate screen entities. So in this case, screen entities only mean the legs of the triangle. So there's three lines. The range of points, I don't want to translate everything. I only want to translate points 1 to 3. Now, how is it going to handle these points? In my case, doing it this time, we are going to overwrite the existing coordinates. Okay, very easy, not too, uh, not too confusing. I'll pick OK. Now, notice the prompt says select objects to translate, points excluded. Well, we told it already. We wanted it to translate points 1 through 3. So, even if we pick a point, it ignores any points that we've got selected here. It's really only paying attention to the line work. And I'll pick Enter. It's translated three points, and you can see that it's moved the line work. So right here, I see that I may have a problem, because when I translated it, I meant for it to pick up the elevation of 0.4. So I meant to change the elevations and translate that Z value as well as the X, X and the Y values. So if we look at list points, and I just look at all of them, you can see that, nope, that didn't happen. So we've made a mistake. And this is one thing I really like about this command is that it's fairly forgiving. Notice that as soon as I go into this box, I have an option to undo the last uh, translate. So I'm going to take advantage of that. And notice that it puts everything right back in place. Now, I'll just do it again. So I'll hit my right mouse key that repeats the command. Pretty much everything stays the same except for that one checkbox that I do want to process the elevations. And you can actually see the deltas. So this is the change in X, the change in Y, the change in Z I'm proposing. Range of points, again, 1 to 3. And then I'm going to do something a little bit different. So this time, instead of actually moving and overwriting point numbers 1 to 3, I'm going to create three new point numbers. So 1 through 3 will remain in place. And value to add. My new points will have point numbers 101, 102, and 103. Now the reason I did this in this order is that handy dandy undo is only available to you if you overwrite. So if you do what we're doing right now, I'm not going to have that option to, to undo. So make sure it's correct. So select objects to translate, and this time I'll just pick the three lines. Translated three points. Aha! Uh -huh. So we still have something that's a little, uh, a little squirrely. So it doesn't show me my new points, even though it said that it did it. I list the points, you can see that it did create point numbers 100, 101, and, uh, 101, 102, and 103, but it doesn't draw them in the drawing. So we'll go to draw locate, tell it to draw all. Oh, I should have turned off my, uh, let's go back and fix that. So I'm going to uncheck this. I didn't mean for it to... Uh, All right, so I'm going to turn that off, tell it to draw locate once again. And now you can see these points. So now I have duplicate points. Point 0.4 and point 0.101 are basically the same. And now I need to rotate everything. So if I go to points, adjust coordinates, and rotate. So again, you just got to look at the kind of the top line here. So the point that I want to rotate about is going to be either 0.4 or 101. It doesn't really matter, so I'll just type in 0.4. Now the next line is the original bearing. So the original bearing in this case is the angle from 0.101 to 102. And the destination or the desired bearing is going to be the bearing between 0.4 and 0.5. Um, again, I'll rotate the screen entities. The range of points 
is this time going to be 101, oops, 101 to 103. And again, I will overwrite existing coordinates. Same thing applies as it does in translate. If I overwrite, then I'll have the ability to undo. If I create new point numbers when I do this step, I won't be able to undo the last rotate. So I think everything here is good. Select the objects to rotate. It's going to be here, here, and here. Hit Enter. And now since it over, overwrote, you can see that the points actually show up. So that is translate and rotate. So pretty, uh, pretty handy little command. So now let's look at yeah, two more small and quick little things. Um, another thing that I really like is the under point utilities, compare points. So we've got three different options. Uh, for comparing points. So the first one, we're going to go through this three times and look at the comparison. So the drawing. What this is going to ask, or give me the ability to do, is compare the location of the points in the drawing versus the point um, coordinates in the CRD file. Okay, so we're going to do this first. The output option, I can have it show me a the bearing, so the difference between them in a bearing format. I can do delta x, delta y, or north, south, east, and west. Horizontal tolerance. So as surveyors, a foot is probably kind of a bad thing, so we'll set that at a point 0.1. You can set the vertical tolerance. I don't know, I'm going to set it to point 0.1. And I think everything else you can set it up to, uh, to the different decimal places. Click OK. Now it prompts me to select the Carlson points that I want to check. So I want to check all of them. Again, remember we're, co we're comparing the drawing against the CRD file to make sure that they are in sync. And so this is a good, a good note. It tells me here, and I like to just kind of point this out, this is a a, a very good report because it tells me exactly what's been checked. So it compared the drawing to this coordinate file and it found no difference is greater than 0.1 in the X, the Y, or the Z. So it's a good good thing to see. So let's re um, compare again. This time I'll use the current coordinate file. This option allows me to select and check um, two different ranges of points in the same CRD file. So my base range, what I'd like to see is how closely aligned are points 4 to 5, 4 and 5, if compared against points 101 and 102. And I'll pick OK. And you can see that we, uh, we've got a problem. So again, here it's showing us the coordinate file that we used. And it found a discrepancy. So even though it looked like the distance between 1 and 2 originally was the same as the distance between 4 and 5, they weren't. So when we translated and rotated, we have a little bit of a bust down here. And that bust, that horizontal distance, is outside of our tolerance. And so it shows up and tells us the bearing. And then lastly, let's go right back through Translate one more time. And this time, we're going to compare our co current coordinate file against the different coordinate file. So this is where the comparison coordinate file, I'm going to go back and look at the one that I had originally before we made any changes. And range of points to compare, I want to see all of them. And it reports the missing. I skipped right on past that, sorry. Um, there was a checkbox there to report survey missing and design missing. It's telling me here what the two different comparison files are. It compared all of them right here. And then it also even tells me what the tolerance I had set. And it recognizes the points 101 to 103 were not in coordinate file 2. So they were not in the original, which we know because we created them. All right, so one last thing um, that's kind of important, very briefly. 
under points, coordinate file utilities. So a lot of the um, commands dealing with point files and points in the drawing are all located in the menu structure here. But if you want to see kind of all of them in one fell swoop and everything available to you, this, this may be where you go to find a lot of that. So notice the two different columns. On the left is file utilities. Um, look at this as making changes or potentially making changes to the CRD file where for the most part the ones on the right are making changes or potentially making changes to the drawing. So kind of keep that together. Two things that I always um, point out are the two bottom ones here on the left. So again, we really try, if we have points in the drawing and we're associated with a CRD file, unless you're using multiple CRD files, for the most part you want to make sure that points in the drawing are in sync with the points in the CRD file. If they're not, these two buttons allow you to update one from the other. So this button, update drawing from the CRD file, so that will get rid of the points in the drawing or make changes or prompt you um, for changes where the drawing does not match the CRD file. And then going the other direction, you can also update the CRD file based on points in the drawing. So if a point gets moved, it wasn't point protected, and so on, you may need to take advantage of those. But then also, if you remember, one of the very first things I showed when the webinar started was under Carlson Configure, we turned on point history. So point history from here. Under the Commands tab, it actually shows you all of the point-related commands that have been done in this drawing. So Translate Points is where I did it originally and messed it up. Translate Points again is the one where I reversed that. Next, I translated. That's where I created points 1 to 101 to 103. And then I rotated points 101 to 103. You can use the Points tab to see individually what happened based on each point. So point 1 has not been adjusted, or points 1 through 5 have not been adjusted according to this column. The points 101, 102, and 103 have. And I can also select on any um, particular point and pick History. And notice that I can't expand that but it tells me what happened to that particular point. So originally, um, you can see that it was, sorry, this is the translate, and this is the rotate. If I scoot to the right, you can even see it's got a timestamp. And let's look at point three, I think. Yep, that's what I wanted to see. So point three, notice that there's the original translate, and then that's where we undid that translate. And then I can even report that. And it even tells you who did it, so you can actually go back and try to figure that kind of thing out. So anyway, that's where I'm going to wrap up. Butch, if uh, you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Well, there was one that came up toward the first year after I was asking some other questions. I might have, you might have gone over this. When they're using field to finish, all the elements come in are in a block, including the symbol. How can they keep the symbol from being in the block? Um, I think, if I understand it correctly, that is going to be right here. So separate attribute values. Um, your okay. options here are to separate point symbols or both. And so when you go to symbols, and I did exactly that. Yeah. yeah. So my symbols, so the triangle was on the symbol layer, but the point, the little dot in this case, is actually on uh, that layer. Uh, that was from uh, Leslie. I hope that answers your question, Leslie. And that's, I think we got the rest of them uh, answered, Jennifer. All right. Well, very good. So um, I guess we'll just switch back here and just hit this one more time. Um, oops. 
So these are the classes that I'm going to be having here in the next month or two, and then switch back one more. And the upcoming Carlson webinars will just kind of end with that. And I appreciate everyone attending. And as always, feel free to contact me. I think my information is here. Feel free to contact me and use me as a resource for your CAD-related or Carlson questions. And thank everybody for attending. Thank you, Jennifer.